Hi everyone, and welcome to the Drug Discovery and Clinical Trial Optimization Working Group, part of the Demon Network. Um, it's a pleasure today to host um, Vera. Dr. Vera is a clinician physician, is a physician scientist, and um, similar to him, we share a similar background to our interest in genomics, drug discovery, and um, Vera is. Um, the first time I came across uh, via, um, it was on Twitter, and I was really impressed the way he deals like um, with the information available for everyone. It's very intuitive to him, and um, it's almost inter always interesting to see how people um, read a scientific text, uh, text differently. And uh, Vera got the talent, and then I think um, I'm very excited for today's uh, uh, meeting. Um, Vera, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, so uh, hello everyone. And um, yeah, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Ahmed, for, for this invitation, for this opportunity to talk in this meeting. And um, thank you to everyone for being here to listen to my talk. Um, so about me, so... Um, so my name is Veera Rajagopal and I'm a research scientist um, at a drug pharmaceutical company in US uh, called uh, Regenron. And um, I'm part of a translational genetics uh, department uh, where we are, that is focusing on drug discovery in the fields of neurology, ophthalmology, and uh, recently also psychiatry. And um, uh, so, yeah, so we try to do large scale genome or gene genetic association studies to identify drug targets and we uh, provide these drug targets to the, you know, the company, uh, uh, the drug developers who will, you know, if it is a potential target, they uh, try to enroll the target in a drug development program. And um, yeah, so for, so before I start my uh, today's talk, so I will just, um, uh, show few of the corporate slides. So don't don't be scared. I'm not here to sell any drugs to you. So uh, it's just a um, uh, little bit facts about the company can set the, set the stage for the talk that uh, for the discussion that we'll be having today. Uh, and uh, I, maybe you'll understand when I uh, when I get to the topic. Um, so the, the the name of the company, the actual company where I work, is actually Regenron Genetic Center, which is actually a, a fully owned subsidiary of a major uh, biotechnology company called uh, Regenron. So um, Regenron is, you know, uh, so it's the main goal of the company is drug development. So they have like. Uh, nine FDA approved drugs currently in the market, including, you know, alirocumab, the PCSK9 inhibitor uh, that um, many of us uh, are, you know, familiar with. So they also have 30 medicines in the various stages of the clinical development. So one of the, you know, the main strengths of the company is their suite of patented technologies that they have established over the years. And this is what is actually driving uh, the drug development uh, validation and also discovery. So they together they they call this technology this uh, technology like velocity suit uh, just to highlight a couple of uh, these like you know in terms of drug uh, validation uh, you know so they have like technologies like velocity gene velocity mouse velocity gene. Uh, is a technology to create uh, you know high throughput uh, to edit embryonic stem cells of mice in a high throughput automated manner. And um, uh, so LRC mouse is the technology to create transgenic mice from the you know gene edited embryonic stem cells in a in a in an automated high throughput manner without any necessity for uh, breeding the mouse. So like this they have so many technologies that actually drive the you know the drug development and manufacturing program. Uh, but the important thing for all this is that drug discovery, right? So you need drug targets to validate and develop. And that's when once having established these technologies, the company actually started focusing on drug target discovery in-house. And, you know, obviously they choose human genetics. So 
uh, maybe many of uh, the people are not aware of this, but the region Ron is one of the very early companies to actually embrace human genetics. Uh, you know, they under they really realize uh, they had an early realization that to effectively, you know, to to discover drug targets in an unbiased manner, you have to have a hypothesis free approach to look at the genome wide scale. And um, so they started investing in human genetics long time ago. And uh, so that is how uh, region run genetic center was born. So uh, they initially started with a small center with the exome sequencing facility. And um, over the years, they kept investing a lot in the center. And today we have one of the world, you know, world class sequencing uh, facility, exome yeah, sequencing okay. facility in the center. Um, so they have capacities to, you know, like to hold uh, multiple, you know, uh, versions of UK Biobank. Uh, so they have um, automated every step of the process, starting from archiving the sample, retrieving them and, you know, extracting DNA and sequencing. And uh, so they have sequenced up to two million exomes to date and uh, they are they have samples in the pipeline and they expect to sequence one million in each of the next few years. And uh, you can imagine how much data can such a you know large uh, sequencing efforts can produce. And they have an excellent infrastructure. They have a long, uh, long standing collaboration with uh, uh, companies like DNA Nexus and Amazon Web Services. So they have a perfect, you know, like a setup to, you know, uh, do this drug discovery at scale, drug target discovery. And um, so the key question, so many of you may be wondering, all, all this is good, but where the samples come from, right? We need the samples to sequence them. So, and uh, again, region one is one of the pioneer in establishing, you know, what is now becoming a very successful formula of industry academic collaboration. So the very first collaboration they established was with the Geisinger Health System, which is a regional healthcare provider in Pennsylvania. And um, so two major discoveries actually was born out of this collaboration. One is the ANGPTL3 uh, loss of function association with protection against cardiovascular disease. And based on this actually accelerated the, the, the already the ANGPTL3 program that they had in the company. And now we, uh, they have a FDA approved uh, you know, drug in the market. And other major discovery is the HSD17 B13 uh, loss of function variant. Uh, that protects against the chronic liver disease and they have a clinical program right now which is in a you know so this is progressing i think great and um so following that uh, they started collaborating and today we have like almost for 30 to 40 collaborators spread across the world and all these collaborators together contributed up to like 2 million samples which is expected to increase like to a few more millions in a in a few years and uh, Many drug dis uh, major discoveries have happened very recently because of these collaborations. Uh, some of these papers, which you might be aware of, including the one where I worked on in the past one year, where we identified this protective association with CHR and B2 for smoking. So, um, so many on exciting projects is going on, and uh, in many more discoveries are about to be announced soon in the following years. Um, so that is um, that's about the company. So let's talk. Let's talk science. Um, so for today's talk, so just a heads up that I'm not gonna present anything that I'm I or my colleagues are doing at the company. So I I decided you know that I can just do a very basic discussion of the drug discovery, how the field is evolving. You know, still we are learning and. Uh, I think it will be, I thought it would be more useful uh, uh, when you have a broad discussion rather than focusing on a very particular study. So, um, so you know, so what I'm going to discuss is about the papers that has been published so far uh, in the in the human genetics, focusing on rare variants, also common variants. And this is something that I read day to day and tweet about it and what I learned about it. And probably a lot of you are authors of the papers that I might might show. So I, I just want to tell that. So what I'm telling is like, it's my understanding of this and it's it's a, you know, it's an ongoing process and uh, nothing is perfect and it's no hard rules. And I also want to apologize if I misinterpret any of the findings and please uh, feel free to correct me if uh, if I state something wrong, if I interpret something wrong. So 
Um, so what, uh, what I'm plan how I plan this uh, lecture is that I'm going to answer four main questions for, you know, why is it important uh, for in terms of, you know, a drug target discovery? Why, why human genetics, first of all, and then why uh, all the companies are going for exome sequencing? Why it's rare variants? What's special about that? And then why are everyone going in into the wild and you know sequencing everyone in the road and you know like in the general population and why why and the very important last question is why it's important that we need to sequence diverse set of populations. Um, so let's start with the first question. So you know why human genetics? Uh, so it's a very you know like there's two perspectives when it comes to human genetics at least you know major two perspectives one is clinical genetics standpoint and the other one is population genetics and uh, this might look very simple but you know you'd be surprised that a lot of people actually do not uh, understand the difference so in a gen you know commonly people see human genetics as you know uh, as a process where a scientist or a doctor, you know, uh, treats a patient with a genetic disease, they sequence the cases and then the controls or, you know, try to identify the genetic cause and then treat the genetic cause, treat the condition, either, you know, addressing the genetic cause or the symptoms associated with this. So this is the actual picture, you know, that Im people imagine. And so when they start to cringe their face, when you say, I'm going to go and sequence the general population or people you know, with diabetes or hypertension, which is like a clearly a polygenic disease. I still remember many years ago, uh, you know, uh, when I was back in India, I was just starting my career in the human genetics. I was enthusiastically explaining to my, one of my senior colleagues who's a clinical, you know, who's a, who's a giant in genetics and um, uh, saying that it, it, I was telling about large scale genetic association studies that's been happening, you know, in the, the center where I just joined to start a PhD. And um, so uh, this professor actually, uh, ex you know, uh, expressed that, you know, uh, sequencing, you know, individuals for like common diseases is complete waste of money and it is a futile task and we could invest that in, you know, in better ways. So I think that day uh, I didn't have the wisdom to explain about, you know, the real, you know, goal of such efforts. But today we know that you know there is also this population genetics the main goal of this population genetics is not to identify some genetic cause of a disease and then fix that genetic cause but we are just trying to identify any kind of entry points to understand the pathology of the condition and also to identify any natural natural interventions genetic interventions you know, using which we can actually reverse engineer this mechanism and share the blessings of a few individuals in the population with the whole population. You know, when I uh, think about natural interventions that we can learn from, you know, from the from the net from the genetic associate association findings, there are so many. But this is something that actually, you know, I I really like a lot about this paper, this finding. So. You know, like ABO blood group system, there is also an another blood group system called MNS blood group system, which is determined based on the MNS antigens, the glycophorin genes in the cell, red blood cell membrane. And uh, DUN2 is a subgroup of uh, MNS blood group, and it is uh, because of a genetic variation that actually uh, resulted in a, you know, recombination of two glycophorin genes resulting in a chimeric protein. And uh, so this uh, variations is quite common in some of the regions of Africa, and uh, it actually uh, offers protection against malaria. And this is known for a long time, but however, the mechanism how this uh, genetic variation leads to malaria protection has been a mystery for until recently. And there's like many hypotheses, people's all centered around, you know, the uh, the receptors in the red cell memory, which with the parasites interact. But uh, in 2020, an amazing paper was uh, published in Nature, and uh, that for the first time they reported the mechanism uh, of action of this uh, genetic variation. You know, and um, it turned out extraordinarily simple. It's just what happened is that this genetic variation actually altered the physical property of the red blood cell membrane is just stretched and, you know, made it tense. And it turns out that if the RBC membranes are stretched and tense, the parasites cannot enter inside the RBCs. And you can see here, there is a linear relationship between the RBC membrane tension and parasitemia. 
And um, so such an extraordinarily simple intervention that we are learning actually from, an at, from a genetic variation. So, but the main important point here is that this is like, once we identify the genetic mechanism, then the genetic variation goes out of the picture, right? So here, this is the same, this protection effect of the ten, RBC tension is same even in people without the, you know, done to phenotype. Even they have a subset of RBC cells that actually have high RBC tension and actually resist the invasion of the parasitemia. And so this kind of opens up the question, you know, so is it possible to identify drugs that can mimic the done to effects to protect against malaria? Or even we can do genetic association studies for the RBC tension as endophenotype to identify other opportunities. There is a beautiful thread by the last author, Julian Rayner, published in 2020. So this is one of the one of my very favorite uh, study. You know, it's not to say that oh we have a drug based on this and just cured malaria, but it's just I just wanted to understand the rationale, the concept behind this. This is what we are trying to do. We are trying to identify natural interventions. So the perfect design can always come from the nature, from the evolutionary processes. So uh, I have created two images here using Dali. It took a lot of time, and this is not a you know a possum instructing a scientist to do what experiment. Um, I couldn't really get the what I imagined, but anyway. So the the slide I just want to show uh, show a comparison between a human genetist who actually go looking for genetic variation in the general population and then the lab experimental biologists who do complex genetic experiments in the lab by manipulating the gene. So what an experimental biologist uh, do they kind of to study the function of a gene, they knock out the gene, they overexpress the gene in a specific tissue or in the whole body at a specific time point or throughout the life of the animal and study the phenotypic consequences. And, and the human genetists instead go looking for genetic variations that represent, you know, either loss of function or gain of function and try to study the phenotypic consequences. In a lot of ways, it is better, it is easier actually to do, you know, uh, experiments in mice rather than go looking for uh, human genetic variations. But why it is important? So there happened like there's two lines of realization happened recently. That is one, people started, you know, realizing that it is uh, human physiology is extraordinarily complicated and it's always not possible to reproduce, recapitulate this human physiology in animal models. And people started realizing that, you know, particularly for CNS diseases, that there is like a high failure rates. Could uh, people start attributing the failure rates towards the lack of translation between animal models to humans? So, at all of that, a lot of people came to the conclusion that, you know, at the end of the day, the most accurate animal model would be the humans themselves. And the, another line of realization is that people started looking at retrospectively analyzing, you know, the drug targets to identify to see how much has human genetics, you know, support these targets. And it turned out you might be very familiar with these couple of papers. One is the Nelson et al. published Nature Genetics, and the other one is the PLOS Genetics paper, where they came to a very similar conclusion that you know, like uh, when the gen when the drugs have a genetic support, they are they are more successful at all different stages of clinical development. And a very recent paper from last year from the Open Targets, they also show a very similar thing. But it's how to it's important that we should understand this is like a retrospective analysis. So it is a confirmation bias. Right, so uh, we do really do not know if we make this approach in a straightforward. This is how it's going to be, but this had a tremendous impact on the uh, industries. You know, so there has been a big, so a lot of the industry started establishing human genetics department, and this is one of the main reason. There is like a huge migration of people from academic side to industry side because everyone starting to realize that it's absolutely important that you establish a human genetic center and try to get human genetic evidence, even for the drug targets that they already have in the pipeline. Um, so that is human genetics. That's why, you know, because we, we need human genetics for the drug discovery. And the second question, you know, why rare variants? Why people are going for exome sequencing, you know, rather than looking at the common variants? So I'm going to talk five points, five major points to emphasize, you know, what the importance of rare variants. And, um, so the first one is they it's a very obvious, but it's worth still worth stating the pinpoint causal gene. So um, 
whenever you find a genetic association and if the gen if the genetic association the the variant is located in a gene in the coding region if it is a functional variant most often the gene is the causal gene so it's a very nice paper you know uh, in this paper they actually tried to uh, train a prediction algorithm to identify causal genes um, at the GWAS lo lo loci, you know, uh, they had a, a handful of uh, gold standard sets that were, you know, for sure, you know, what is the causal gene and this locus, and they tried to, uh, you know, include many of the genomic features. And uh, if you look at it, the most important feature is, of course, obviously, if it has to, there has to be some genes near the near the locus, you know. So that's the most predict important predictor. And the second most important is the is the, the presence of a coding functional variant as pretty, you know, of different classes of functional variant annotated by the SNP of, uh, you know, annotation. So that is the most important predictive feature. So it's a very nice, you know, uh, plot that actually emphasizes the importance that. And um, so if you can also realize how importance of this rare variance in identifying the causal genes, if you observe in the recent X versus how it is being used, right? So. Uh, this is a very nice finding. I, I, I frequently quote this in the Twitter threads. Uh, so in 2019, there was a GWAS paper of varicose veins, and they identified one of the identified loci is like uh, located near this gene phase one that many of you might be familiar. It brought the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2021 to Alda Father Putin. And um, so here, if you see here, there are so many genes, right? So like, how do you will find, uh, how will you find if uh, this is the causal gene, right? So one approach is to knock out all of these genes one at a time, you know, in an animal model or in some systems. And uh, it's exhaustive if you want to do it in a scale, but also like I previously mentioned, it's very difficult to recapitulate the human, you know, physiology animal models. So the other way to do is to knock out this gene in humans, which is both unethical and also impossible, right? So, but it turns out, right? So the nature has already performed this experiment. So I, I really like this line from the science uh, review article. So the human population through explosive growth has performed a comprehensive saturation metagenesis experiment on it itself. It is now the case that any single base substitution that is compatible with life is expected to be present somewhere among the near 8 billion living humans. So, you know, in the first 50,000 exons of the, from the UK Biobank, one of the beautiful finding is the association between loss of function variance in phase one and increased risk for varicose veins. And when uh, we did when we did the full exome analysis for 50K, this association even became stronger. And uh, the beauty is we also captured what appears to be a gain of function resistance variant, which we also replicated an independent cohort. So now through the rare variants, we know if you if you inactivate this gene, the risk for varicose vein increases. Also, if you activate the genes, probably the you know it is protecting you against varicose veins, thereby confirming that this is the causal gene at this locus. So this is one of the very important use of using rare variants to combine with the common variants to gather more insights, you know, in the discoveries that's already been made uh, using GWAS studies. So the second one, it has a large effect size. So rare variants often have a large effect size. Many of you might be familiar with this figure. Uh, it's from a fantastic review article so published in 2009 uh, from some of the GNs on the field. And um, so the main um, message here is that it summarizes genetic architecture of, you know, uh, in terms of relationship between uh, allele frequency and uh, FX size. So uh, the idea is that, you know, those variants that have very uh, large FX size, uh, particularly the disease risk increasing effects will be removed actively by purifying selection process. And only those variants that have very small effect size actually escape the natural selection. So they become more common in the population. So at any point of time, when you're trying to identify rare variants, what you will find is the ones that, up, that have originated very recently, very new variants that haven't had the opportunity to exposed to natural selection to be removed. And that is why it is often, you know, rare variants have larger effect sizes. But it is also 
important to note, it is not always rare variants have large effect size. Uh, these are random mutations that happen in right. So you also have rare variants that uh, originated recently that have probably, you know, uh, having small effect sizes, but we will never get to it because you really need incredibly large sample size to identify them. So that's why. So it's by design, by statistical design, we get we identify rare variants with large effect sizes. But that is good because that's what we are interested in. And uh, also one common question is that why protective rare variants are rare? You know, if it is uh, if it is good for the population, why it is rare? Again, it is the same reason. So the protective rare variants that we are identifying in the study are simply they are the variants that have originated recently, and they haven't had the opportunity to be acted upon by natural selection to increase in frequency to become a common variant. Probably a few hundred years from now, these variants might become common, right? So if there existed any common variant, right, uh, that any old variant that actually had a protective effect, we would have easily identified using our genome-wide association studies. There are a few examples that, you know, it comes up very early in the phase. The fact that they don't exist because they don't there, so right? So that's why we end up finding rare variants that are protective effect sizes. So back to our point. So why why it's important? Why why large FX size is so special? So it's special just because the FX size is large. Because like when we find, for example, a loss of function variant that has a substantial FX size protective effect on the disease outcome, then it means that you know. Uh, inhibiting the gene. So it suggests that inhibiting the gene probably will have a therapeutic effect beyond the threshold that is necessary to treat the disease, right? So this is one of the very common uh, debate that happens in the, you know, in the in the Twitter all the time when we talk about GWAS variants and FX sizes. And one of the common argument uh, is that, you know, we should never uh, equate the FX size of a common variant with the therapeutic FX size because a uh, common variant is a mild perturbation and you can actually bring large effect size by designing a drug. That's absolutely true. And um, but we also have to note that, you know, almost always, you know, it's like no one will, no industry will invest in a drug development program in just based on a common variant without, you know, uh, just by assuming that there will be a big effect size when you have a, uh, you know, rare variant. Or so we almost go for searching for rare variant. And so that becomes an absolute necessary in order to, you know, nominate a drug. So in that, that's why, you know, the industry are looking for like rare variants with large effect sizes. So the next one is very straightforward reason. It informs therapeutic hypothesis, right? So um it simply tell you whether you have to inhibit the gene or where you have to you know activate the gene uh to you know for the to for the treatment and um, so the very good example is the pcsk9 so the very first discovery of pcsk9 you know it was happened in a family based and a study where they found autosomal dominant in a in a family with autosomal dominant hypercholesterolemia, they found gain of function mutations, and within two years, they identified loss of function. Two independent groups identified the loss of function mutations that protects against heart disease. And you know, so it became very clear that what you have to do, you have to inhibit the gene in order to for the for the treatment. That's the right treatment. So this hypothesis you can get only through the rare variants when you graph functional variants when we know that what is the effect me mechanism of the variant on the gene. So next is therapeutic efficacy. This is this is more important, and a lot of people do not, you know, uh, appreciate or pay detailed uh, attention to this particular point. So one of the things, you know, we always try to do when we try when we do exome when rare variant associations is we try to capture as many independent alleles or genetic variants associated with the phenotype. We call this an allelic series, and uh, here is a beautiful example. Uh, so what you are seeing here is the, you know, uh, the PCSK9 protein structure, and this is the different alleles or different variants in the PCSK9, all are independently affecting the LDL cholesterol at different effect sizes. There is gain of function, loss of function. So, um, so this is called an allelic series. But why it is important to identify an allelic series? So by capturing the allelic series, what we are trying to accomplish is to identify genetic proxies that capture the full spectrum you know like the of the gene perturbations and try to uh, study the phenotypic 
consequences of this full spectrum to you, you need to have an understanding what is the complete phenotypic spectrum of this you know particular gene and uh, so the, the therapeutic efficacy required to for the treatment of the disease can lie anywhere in the spectrum and uh, a very good example is angiptl3 uh, you know it can it, it actually people have learned a lot of lesson based on this uh, drug development program uh, so the, the therapeutic efficacy of AngiPTL3 inhibition is like 80 percentage. You need more than 80 percentage inhibition to actually acquire, you know, get a thera benefit, therapeutic benefit. And uh, early this year, Ionis and Pfizer, uh, they announced a big, they made a big announcement. They said they're going to discontinue the ASOs for the AngiPTL3. And uh, this is their statement. So even though their ASOs made a statistically significant reduction in the in the cholesterol, in the non-HDL cholesterol, the magnitude of the reduction is simply not sufficient enough to warrant the continuation of the development program. You know, so uh, there is a very interesting thread, maybe you should go and check uh, from Sekar Kathiresan, who is the, you know, famous cardiologist from Broad Institute, is the form for now the CEO of World Therapeutics. And uh, Sekar uh, highlights uh, you know, the, in, in the the human pharmacology of AngiPTL3. So after the drug development program has started, it was, was, it was very clear that you, ne you need greater than 80% uh, inhibition to get a therapeutic benefit. But it turned out that the genetics was all the time, it was actually telling us and we didn't pay enough attention. So Sager highlights this one particular study, very beautiful study that actually from, uh, that was published, you know, like from, uh, based on a sample from Italy. And uh, what they actually did in the study is that they identified a founder mutation, uh, a loss of function mutation in an Italian town uh, where this mutation is present in almost 10 percentage of the residents. So this Italian town is very famous uh, for, you know, for exceptional longevity. So many longevity studies have happened in this town. And um, so this, you know, high prevalent of a single loss of function mutation gave a unique opportunity to quantify the heterozygous and homozygous effect sizes. So at the protein level, AngiPTL3 has a linear relationship with the loss of function variant heterozygous half and then homozygous full reduction. But when you look at the LDL cholesterol, the significant reduction in the cholesterol happened only in the homozygotes, but not in the heterozygotes. And that too is like, you know, close to 50 percentage reduction. And this is what exactly happened with the human pharmacology and the drug development program. And, uh, you know, this is this is genetic studies have been telling this all along and we, we actually missed uh, that information. So very nice that you should go and check. So the, my point is, it is extraordinarily difficult to get predict the effect size therapeutic efficacy based on you know rar variants, let alone common variants. So rar variants plays a crucial role in kind of getting these kinds of insights. And finally, this is one other major important uh, use that is to inform safety and adverse effects. So later, early this year, Alnalem Pharmaceuticals got FDA approval for an RNA therapeutic drug called Lumaciran. And this is uh, this is for the treatment of primary hyperoxaluria type one a, a, a autosomal recessive condition, which is caused by full deficiency of a liver specific enzyme called alanine glyoxylate uh, amino transferase. So because of this defect in the child, the glyoxylate will accumulate, which is convert into oxalate, and it deposits in the kidney, causing kidney failure. So the design is very simple. You know, you just have to inhibit an enzyme, early enzyme, which results in the accumulation of a water soluble uh, glycolate, you know, which can be excreted by kidney. Everything is good. But one key question is that, is it safe? Is it safe to inhibit this uh, gene? You know, so the answer actually came from a British Pakistani woman, uh, you know, who turned out to be a human knockout for this very particular gene that Aldailam was actually trying to target. And to observe this, homozygote, you know, in a general population, in outward population, it seems the odds are one in 30 million. So this woman, after a deep phenotyping, they found she's perfectly healthy. There's no issues except for the metabolic abnormality that you would expect based on her genotype. So she have a very high level of plasma glycolate, uh, which also get excreted in the urine, which uh, because it says that she's safely excreting that through the kidneys without any kidney failure or, you know, dysfunction. And this really accelerated the program for them to get the FDA approval. So that's one of the, you know, benefit of identifying rare mutations to inform drug safety.
So that concludes my RAT coding variance. Why is the RAT coding variance? Second question. And we have two more questions to go. So one is why general population and why diverse population? So why general population? Two reasons. One is, like I mentioned initially, if you want to identify individuals, study individuals that represent the healthy end of the disease spectrum. And uh, second is like you can use quantitative endophenotypes to increase statistical power. So this is a paper that came out from our my colleagues who identified the GPR 75 as a protective association with obesity uh, last year. So one thing that you notice, if you notice here in this plot is that, you know, this is like that in decreases the weight and this is that increases the weight. You might be familiar with MC4R, which is a monogenic cause, right? So we know about this for a long time because people with this condition come to clinic. But we do not know about GPR-75, which has e, as same suffix effect size, even larger than MC4R. And we are learning about one day now because we are going and sequencing people from the general population. So that's very important why we should go and sequence people from the general population. And the second thing is when you go into non-disease population, you have endophenotypes like quantitative endophenotypes like BMI for obesity or some blood biomarkers. What is important? So they are simply... Just for the fact they're quantitative, they use more statistical power than binary phenotypes. And also, you know, they offer more information from the non-disease population. And often they can be measured accurately with very minimal measurement error, which is an important factor that, you know, affects the statistical power. And often they uh, represent early disease changes, which means they're more proximal to the DNA than the actual disease outcome, which also gives more statistical power. To illustrate this, these are the recent major discoveries that happened through the exome sequencing. Almost in every case, the discovery happened because of an endophenotype, GPS 75, BMI, side B for the liver disease, liver enzyme, inhib, and waste ratio, and NGPTL7, IOP. We can see the p-values here. If not for this endophenotype, none of this would have been got discovered, even with this large sample sizes. So that's why you should study general population. The final question, diverse populations. This is a very important question. And um, so, uh, like I mentioned before, often, you know, uh, we try to identify allelic series when we do this trip. And I will tell you this di studying diverse population is the way you can actually go identify, you know, different genetic associations. So it's very simple as that. So the, the goal of these efforts is to identify genetic variations and try to correlate them with phenotypic variations, right? So if you want to identify genetic variations and you have a sample that has more diversity, you can get that only when you go beyond the you know, continent of Europe and go, and this diversity should represent different from, com comes from different factors like geography, culture, language, all this can lead to unique genetic architecture, which will be extremely valuable to identify, for example, certain rare variants that can rise to very high allele frequency. Very good example is the Finnish population. They have, you know, the, how they underwent multiple bottleneck events. And then South Asian populations who are, you know, because of the cultural uh, things, the caste system and the cultural practices, they are high, there is a high prevalence of consanguinity and endogamy in this population. So which increases the homozygous and their TS mutations in this population. So just one, one you know, uh, fact here that probably not many people understand, it's very important that you know, these uh, diverse populations, non-European populations, sometimes the discoveries happen there. But one important lesson we learned in the human genetics, it is always sample size, sample size, sample size. So to make gene discoveries, we need sample size. And that's unfortunately comes from European populations because of the way today's biobanks are operating. But that shouldn't discourage us from studying diverse population because they can offer valuable information once you made the discovery, your search space has become so small that you are going to look at only one gene. So even a small number of individuals from an African population or South Asian population can give extraordinary insights, right? So you can identify independent variants. Sometimes you identify, you discovered, made a discovery based on loss of function variants, and you can go and look at a small set of African population. You might find a gain of function variant. That's an extremely important piece of evidence to support the drug development program. And the other major thing, like I mentioned for this, you know, the Lumosiran example, 
human knockouts. They come from there's so, so a big Pakistani human knockout resource is being set is being established, and so these populations are being offering valuable information to you know the drug discovery program. And this is you know, we should make use of this uh, diverse populations, non-European populations, particularly th these two phases, the validation and the uh, safety assessment. So with that, I'll just conclude with this summary. So human genetics, it opens a window into natural interventions, and these natural interventions can inspire novel and effective drug designs. And sequencing rat coding variants is the most cost effective approach, and that is that you can get just from seeing the companies making their investments mainly in the exome sequencing, and they pinpoint causal genes. They shed light on genetic mechanisms. They inform therapeutic efficacies and also safety and adverse effects. And to discover successful drug targets, one should go look beyond patient populations and should go look beyond uh, European populations and a diverse set of populations. So with that, I'll just stop and then maybe we can spend a few minutes. Uh, if there are any questions, we